Today we're going to be discussing that of Jehu, the king of the Old Testament, whom was the avenger that God uses in order to fulfill the prophecies of Elijah concerning that of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. As one can see from this chart right here, Ahab and Jezebel, they ruled over a decade before Jehu takes the throne. And just a quick reminder, they ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel, not the southern kingdom of Judah, but both kingdoms will be brought up for this reign of Jehu. Now, just to let you all know a little bit about Ahab and Jezebel while they reigned, Scripture tells us this in 1 Kings 21, There was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. Just for context, one should also note about how there was already idolatry like crazy in the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember how the kingdoms divided after Solomon's reign and 10 of the tribes, they went north and said, nope, we're not going to be under David's reign anymore because there were so heavy taxes during the time of Solomon's temple and whatnot. So what 10 of the 12 tribes did was migrate north and set up these two calves, one at Bethel, these idols, these golden calves to worship, at Bethel and Dan, which covers all of Israel right here. So they were already worshiping these golden calves. And as you'll see, Jerusalem is just right here. It's at the midway point. They could have still came down there to worship the true God, but instead they chose to call these golden calves the God of heaven. But if we look just a little bit more north, we see Sidon and Tyre, and those are outside of Israel. Jezebel did not come from Israel. She was part of Sidon. She was a Sidonian. And in that area, not only did they not worship the two golden calves of the northern kingdom of Israel, but they worshiped outright Baal. They didn't even try to pretend like they were serving the true God. So whenever Ahab marries Jezebel, Suddenly, Baal worship is introduced, just like the Canaanites of old. Jezebel sets out to kill the prophets of God. And it's due to the wickedness of this new king and queen that God sends one of his greatest of prophets, and that is Elijah, which brings about three and a half years of famine, as well as the showdown at Mount Carmel, where it's Elijah against hundreds and hundreds of these false prophets of Baal. And thousands of Israelites are watching as the fire of God comes down from heaven and it shocks all of them because it still hasn't rained. Suddenly it, it's raining fire upon them. So something is definitely waking them up. It's a great revival time. But suddenly Elijah, he winds up killing these prophets of Baal and whom Jezebel had set up in place of the true prophets of God. It's then that Jezebel, in a fit of rage, makes it her life's goal to have Elijah killed. It's then that Elijah flees down to Mount Horeb in the area of Mount Sinai, where he fasts for 40 days and 40 nights, terrified for his life. He even asks God, just take my life, O Lord. But it's then, while Elijah is in the cave, that God gives him three commands. And the first one goes, anoint Hazel of Syria to be king of Syria, anoint Jehu to be king of Israel, and anoint Elisha for Elijah's successor. It's after this that we hear about the death of Naboth, the innocent man in whom Jezebel had put to death for his vineyard, which was really the last straw for God because she had already butchered so many of his own people and suddenly she's killing people just for their gardens, basically. And it's right here that we read the curse from Elijah upon the house of Ahab and Jezebel. God says, and thou shalt speak unto him, that is King Ahab, once that he takes Naboth's garden after Naboth's death, and thou shalt speak unto Ahab, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And will make thine house, that is, all the family of Ahab and Jezebel, like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. It's then that we read about Ahab repenting suddenly, in a fit of fear, apparently, because everything that Elijah has prophesied up until this time has come to pass. And suddenly he's being told how God will strike 
him and his household down, so Ahab, he breaks down and repents. Jezebel does no such thing. And it's after Ahab's repentance that we read the Lord telling Elijah, Tell him this now. Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days. Now this is very important. But in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house. So God shows tremendous mercy to Ahab, and he says, Okay, my wrath has been brought back a little bit from your house for now, because you've genuinely repented. But then we read about how a short time later, Ahab begins to go to war with Ramoth Gilead on the east of the Jordan. And it's during this time that he aligns himself with King Jehoshaphat of Judah. And even at this moment, does God show mercy to Ahab because Jehoshaphat of the southern kingdom, whom worships the true God, he says, is there not a true prophet that can tell us whether we should really go to this battle or not? And so Ahab says, yes, there's this man named Micaiah. He's in the prison. He always tells me bad things. And Jehoshaphat says, let him be brought forth. So God, he gives a vision to Micaiah to come out and to prophesy and to tell Ahab, do not go to war. If you go to war, you will die. And in true fashion of Ahab, he ignores the warning of God, and he goes off to battle at Ramoth Gilead. This man shoots a stray arrow just up in the air and strikes Ahab. And just as prophesied, Ahab dies, and the dogs come around and lick up his blood. But Jezebel is still alive, remember. Ahab's son then takes the throne, and one day, just by chance, he falls out of a lattice. And he badly injures himself. He went seeking Beelzebub instead of the true God. So even he, he's this Satan worshiper. Just as Elijah tells him, he dies on his bed just two short years after he took the throne. It's then that we read about his brother, Ahab's other son, Joram, taking the throne. And it's very important to note at this moment about Ahaziah, the king of Judah, the southern kingdom at this time. Aside from Ahab's sons, he also had a daughter named Athaliah. She married the king of Judah, Jehoram, not the Jehoram of the northern kingdom, but the Jehoram of the southern kingdom. And she marries him, and they have a son. They then had a son named Ahaziah, who then succeeded his father as king of Judah. So now we're seeing how Ahab's bloodline through Athaliah, his daughter, has not only continued to reign in the northern kingdom of Israel, but also infiltrated into the Davidic line of the southern kingdom of Judah. So now Ahab's bloodline is reigning from both thrones. It's then that we read in 2 Kings 9 about Elisha, the successor of Elijah, because by this time Elijah has been taken up into heaven. So Elisha, the prophet, called one of the children of the prophets and said unto him, Gird up thy loins and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. So Elisha sends one of these younger prophets to Ramoth Gilead, where the army of Israel is, and Jehu is their commander. He's like the general over the army. And remember, Elijah was given this task, but because Ahab repented, God's wrath was delayed for a time. So the task was left up to Elisha to anoint Hazel and Jehu. So it's then that we read this. He sends this younger prophet on over there to the army. And when the prophet came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, Unto which of all us? And he said, To thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on Jehu's head, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. So he immediately gains the loyalty of all the army. And then Jehu rode in a chariot and went to Jezreel. For Joram lay there, King Joram at that time, Ahab's son, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, was come down to see Joram. So both kings of the southern and northern kingdom are located in the very same vicinity and both the blood relatives of Ahab. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? Do you come in peace? And Jehu answered the king, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said to Ahaziah, There is treachery, O Ahaziah. 
And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms, and the arrow went out at his heart, and he sunk down in his chariot. But when Ahaziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled by the way of the garden house. And Jehu followed after him and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up to Ger, which is by Iblim, and he fled to Megiddo and died there. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her hair and looked out a window. It's so characteristic of her. She doesn't even call upon her false gods for salvation. No, what does she do? She puts makeup on and a little crown upon her head, and she begins to speak to Jehu before he comes up there to kill her. And as Jehu entered in at the gate, she said, Had Zimri peace who slew his master? And with that, she's trying to dissuade Jehu from going through with his plan, and she's trying to say, Look, you'll have no peace. People will hunt after you if you kill me. And Jehu lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? And there looked out to him two or three eunuchs. And he said, Throw her down. So they threw her down. And some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses. And Jehu trod her underfoot. So now Jezebel is dead. And what does Jehu do? He goes in and he begins to eat so that the prophecy of Elijah can be fulfilled. Then the dogs come up. And they began to eat at her dead body. And after a time, he tells them, get whatever remains of her and bury them because she's a princess. But those three are far from being the only ones left of the house of Ahab. So we read about this. And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. And Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, saying, Your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also, and armor, look even out the best and meetest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. Jehu's telling the descendants of Ahab and all of their allies, he says, Arm yourselves and fight me. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him, Ahaziah and Joram. How then shall we stand? And so the rulers of the city basically write back saying, Whatever you ask, we'll do. Then Jehu wrote a letter the second time to them saying, If ye be mine, and if ye will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. Now the king's sons, being seventy persons, were with the great men of the city, which brought them. And sure enough, they cut off every head of Ahab's descendants, load them up and bring them to Jehu. But Jehu is not done there. It's afterwards that we read this. And Jehu arose and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was at the shearing house in the way, Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? They had come up to see what's going on with our king. And Jehu, who just killed their king, He meets with them and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah, and we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And Jehu said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men, forty-two men, neither left he any of them. And Jehu is still not finished. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he gave him his hand, and he took him up to him into the chariot. Now, these sons of Rechab, they were noted, even in the book of Jeremiah, as being men of God. They wouldn't drink wine or any of this. They were good men of God. And Jehu said to the man, Come with me, and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained unto Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord which he spake to Elijah. And Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. Now listen to this. He's not finished with this onslaught. He continues with this. All the house of Ahab are now dead, but now he's wanting to do away with this Baal worship. So Jehu concocts this plan to win the trust of the Baal worshipers. And once again, he says, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to another. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burn offerings, Jehu appointed fourscore men outside, eighty men of his own outside, and said, 
If any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth him go, his life shall be for the life of him. It's then that his soldiers go in and butcher these bell worshippers. And then they make their way outside the city, and Jehu orders them to destroy all the statues of Baal. So Jehu goes through all of that in order to extinguish the worship of these pagans, these idols. He even tries to get rid of all the pagan worshippers. And then we read in verse 29 of 2 Kings 10 this, How be it, from the sands of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the very first person in whom led the ten tribes, up to the north, separating themselves from the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and thereby the Solomon's temple, in which you worship the true God in, Jeroboam also was the one in whom set up the two calves and began this whole idolatrous affair. Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Which does happen, Jehu has four descendants after him of his own bloodline reign over the northern kingdom of Israel. One of them reigns longer than any of the other kings, 41 years, and it's during their reigns that we see the prophets Jonah, Amos, and Hosea sent unto them. So the Lord was really trying to get them all to stay in line, but they allow the two calves to remain and idolatry persist. So God promises Jehu that four generations of his will remain the kings of the northern kingdom. But we still read in verse 31, But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He only went halfway with it. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. And the two golden calves remained in the northern kingdom until they were eventually wiped out by the Assyrians. But the reason being for that was mostly political. Jehu probably feared that if people journeyed down to worship at Jerusalem, where God commanded them to come worship him, he thought that maybe he would lose the throne then, and then they would join up with Judah and all be part of the Davidic rule again. But we immediately read in verse 32 right after, In those days the Lord began to cut Israel short, and Hazel smote them and all the coast of Israel. Jehu is certainly one of the most fascinating kings noted in the Old Testament and there's something very strange about Jehu. We actually have archaeological proof of his reign. Here is a black alabaster monument, which was discovered in the central building at Nimrod in 1846. It records Shalmaneser III, in whom was the king of Assyria. It records his military achievements throughout the first 31 years of his reign and includes reliefs of the tributes that were paid by five of the regions that he conquered. The inscription over one of these reliefs reads, Tribute of Jehu, son of Omri. This relief contains an image of Shalmaneser III receiving this tribute from a prostrate figure. Many scholars believe this to be an image of King Jehu. Now, this is quite unique because if this truly be the image of Jehu, it is the only ancient Hebrew king, Jehu, whose contemporary likeness has survived. Here is also an image of Iron Age ruins dating back to the time of Jehu of the Israelite palace on the Acropolis at Samaria. So in closing, what can we learn from Jehu? Number one, God sets up kings and brings them down. Number two, God keeps his promises just as was prophesied through his prophet Elijah, about what would happen, did truly come to pass, but it was delayed. And there's something to be learned in that delay as well. Because that means that God will hear your prayers of repentance, just as he did Ahab, just as he does Hezekiah years later. Hezekiah, he prays unto God to allow him to live, and God gives him 15 more years of life unto that. So God keeps his promises and indeed hears our prayers. Number three, God rewards faithfulness. Though Jehu did not do away with the two golden calves, 
God also says to him, you have pleased me because you have went through and annihilated Baal worship. As well as ridding the throne of Ahab's descendants, Hebrews 6.10 tells us this, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. God will not forget the work you do for him. Just as Hebrews 11 tells us, the great faith chapter of the New Testament, but without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is the true God, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So though God is a rewarder of our faithfulness, we also must know, number four, God punishes lukewarmness. Remember once again how Jehu indeed, he got rid of Baal, but not the two golden calves. And God was displeased with that. In Revelation 3.15, Jesus tells the church of Laodicea, and this goes for each and every one of us, I know thou works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Be one or the other. Don't be lukewarm. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. He says, you're disgusting. And he's likening individuals to food. He says, no one likes lukewarm food. So yes, Jehu did rid Israel of Ahab and Baal worship and Jezebel. He did all those things. But he allowed a little bit to remain, the two golden calves, and they remained in idolatry, and that was their utter ruin. So let us remember... Don't just partly clean the house. Don't just partly do anything whenever it comes to God. My dad tells me this all the time. He says, son, if you're going to preach, you better be 100% in or not in at all.